I've been working on several questions over the years. I'm particularly interested in developing a cognitive model towards memory accuracy more generally. And so aging is a part of that because we can see how memory is changing as a function of age. But if we think about memory accuracy or memory inaccuracy, we can think about, well, what is memory for? Um, I define memory specifically in this case as episodic memory, or that memory for what, where, when, how. And we know that episodic memory is notoriously fallible, su um, subject to errors, distortion, even false memories. So my lab has spent a good deal of time describing and understanding false memories generally, looking also at factors that are going to allow individuals to better differentiate between things that, all, that did actually happen versus things that never did occur. We think that this is particularly important for uh, a very applied situations like eyewitness memory. I do a lot of work in the court system in the United States, and so in that system, we heavily rely on the testimony of eyewitnesses. Uh, and that testimony has led to the wrongful conviction of hundreds of individuals that have been documented and later exonerated by DNA evidence. And so we have to think, okay, well, why are these eyewitnesses so fallible? And are there ways to interview eyewitnesses to reduce that distortion in memory. We've done a lot of work looking at that. And one of the things that we've found in our research is when you first question eyewitness is crucial for their memory stability or instability. We found that, at least in the, in the U.S. And, and perhaps here in Chile as well, if you witness a crime, the first thing typically that one does is calls the police, right? We call 911, and the 911 operator then asks us a series of questions. What did you see? What happened? Who was there? Are you okay? So it, it's essentially your first memory test. Now, research in, in the memory literature suggests that that kind of testing actually might be very useful, beneficial for memory, right? That we have retrieved that information, it now becomes a stable, robust representation that we can later retrieve at a later date. However, in the context of eyewitness memory, that first test also makes that memory somewhat more susceptible to distortion. We have a paradigm, we call it the retrieval enhanced suggestibility paradigm. And it's very similar to your standard misinformation paradigm that I spoke of earlier. Uh, but there's one crucial difference in comparison. So in, this, in these studies, subjects witness an event. Half of the subjects then take a test immediately after witnessing that event. And our original hypothesis was that taking that test was going to be beneficial. That it was going to reduce susceptibility to distortion for, from subsequent incorrect information. So we had subjects take that test, another group of subjects, they just did a control task. Then both groups of subjects were presented with the misleading narrative, information that is correct and then inconsistent with the uh, originally presented information. And then we tested subjects again about their memory for the original event. And we found that contrary to our initial hypothesis, Taking that first test made subjects more susceptible to the misleading post-event information. So they had a more difficult time retrieving correct details from the first event, and they were more likely to produce the suggested details. We were confused. Uh, and so whenever you find a novel and... Uh, controversial finding in the literature. Well, you spend time, you replicate it, 
you delve deeply into what might be going on mechanistically, and that's what we did. And it's been now replicated uh, at least a dozen times across uh, multiple labs in the United States and, um, and abroad for us. And we find that, yes, it's a robust phenomena, but it's not that memories become inaccessible when you take that initial test. It's that subjects who've taken that initial test learn the subsequent narrative better than subjects who don't. Testing potentiates learning. And this is a phenomenon that we not only see in eyewitness memory literature, but we see it in standard verbal learning le paradigms, and we see it in uh, educationally relevant paradigms when we're looking at students taking multiple tests. The taking that initial test is actually beneficial for memory, but what happens is that subjects have learned both the original information and the post-event narrative so well that they have to now discriminate between the two sources. So now we're delving into why discrimination, or that kind of source discrimination, is more challenging when you have these two very robust memory representations. Our research has looked at potentially when to warn individuals, how to test individuals, how much time we might want to give individuals when answering questions, whether we should give individuals the opportunity to produce multiple answers and then choose which one they think is correct. All of those have led us to um, realize that what's going on is that subjects are learning these two sources of information very well if they take that test, but they are basing their first memory response on the information that is the most accessible, and that is the information that is closest in time to that final test. It doesn't mean that they don't have the other information, it just means that they're not thinking about it in the time, and if you tell them to, hey, is there other information, hey, by the way, the information that was presented afterwards is suspect, then they can actually implement careful source discrimination. This kind of research has had um, lots of impact in the legal arena. And so one of the things I do, and actually I was doing right before you came in to the office, uh, is I do a lot of um, expert testimony. And I often have cases in which uh, individuals, witnesses, are giving testimony. So I look to see how those witnesses were questioned by police, whether they were exposed to incorrect information, and whether we can get those witnesses to respond with different, perhaps more accurate information in the context of their interview. If a witness sees a crime, generally there's going to be some stress response associated with that. Uh, maybe it's a violent crime, or maybe it's a car accident and someone's injured. If the witness has seen this, there's a physiological change, and that physiological change very well may impact what the witness is attending to, what the witness will later remember, and how we should question them. So yes, we will be uh, looking into that and how that kind of stress response interacts with that phenomena of retrieval enhanced suggestibility. As graduate director and as uh, the director of my own lab, where I have five graduate students right now, what I really want graduate students to come out of our program with is the ability to flexibly deal with new scientific questions. They are obviously going to accumulate a large body of knowledge while in graduate school. All graduate students read a lot of papers, take many classes, and start to build an independent program of research. But they get a lot of support from their supervisors and their mentors, as well as the graduate directors. What they should be able to do by the time they leave the program in four or five years is they should be able to deal with any sort of novel question that uh, an audience member might pose to them. And they should be able to take those novel questions and propose new ways uh, and new ideas. I think that graduate students, at least in cognition, should really think about how we human beings 
understand and interpret the world? What is our knowledge structure and how do we represent knowledge of the world? What is the graduate student's understanding of that representation? And they should be flexible such that they can modify that understanding with new knowledge. I think that's hard to, to actually quantify and it's also hard to uh, get students to that point where you think that they are able to do that. I know that um, in your program you guys uh, have qualifying exams or comprehensive exams. We no longer have those and I think that's maybe not the best choice. I think comprehensive exams are designed to facilitate the development of that flexibility. Uh, what we do, uh, which also I think helps, is have a number of opportunities where students have to defend their ideas. And some students do it more successfully than others. But I think that's the ultimate goal. I think a secondary goal of any good doctoral program should be to teach uh, students not only to ask provocative questions and be able to operationalize those questions, but also to be able to communicate those questions both in the written form and orally. A student should be able to give, to, to describe his or her, her research to his grandmother as well as to someone he might be interviewing with, right? Everyone should be able to access that information. We should be able to communicate these ideas very broadly. And the only way you can learn to broadly communicate ideas is by practicing, right? So you have to go out and give talks. You have to go and talk to different people about the kinds of ideas you have and be willing, uh, be open to criticism. It is extremely important. And so when I was invited, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, it's, I get to communicate my ideas to a new group of scientists those scientists are going to have a completely different perspective than I'm used to hearing when it comes to the ideas that I've been thinking about. And so they're likely, the, the, the discussions that we have both during the talk and perhaps more informally after the talk or before the talk, are going to change the way that I think about how knowledge is represented. It's going to change potentially the kinds of ideas that I have. So many of my collaborations and new ideas come out of interactions that I've had with individuals when I've been invited to a university to give a colloquia or when I've been invited to a particular conference. I have so many, in fact, all of my collaborations really do stem from those interactions. So it's useful for me personally, but I think it's also useful for scientists to continue to engage both nationally and internationally because the perspectives that uh, each scientist is bringing to a particular problem is going to be somewhat novel. Our training, our, our background, all, is, all inform the way that we think about the world and that's going to inform the kinds of questions that we ask. I think that in order for scientists, psychological scientists, to gain momentum, to push our field forward, we have to also begin to start to unify our theoretical models. One of, I think, the problems you see in experimental psychology and cognitive psychology specifically is a, an abundance of theoretical models. Everyone has a model. And we, we are not agreeing generally on how best to approach say, specific questions of attention or memory. In fact, many of us can't even agree on what a definition of attention actually is. And so only through conferences, congresses, going to different universities and having these kinds of discussions will we move forward and start to agree on how to approach these kinds of questions. <laughs> well, I thank you for inviting me. It's been a wonderful experience so far. Thank you.